And it is time for me to introduce our special guest. I don't know if she flew here this morning, but I know that she is waiting in the wings. So I would like to welcome Dr. Daisy Century as Bessie Coleman, the first black female aviator. Fly away, fly away, fly up high. Fly away, fly away and never come down. Fly, fly, fly. It's hot out here. Let's see. Oh, the flies. <sighs> I don't know why we have to pick cotton all day long, but Mama said, pick cotton best. Pick cotton. The more cotton we pick, the more money we'll have to put food on the table. Pick cotton best. Pick, pick, pick. <gasps> pick a beautiful Butterfly. Rest ah! <laughs> Coleman, get back to work, girl. Yes, ma'am. Pick, pick, pick. This one row is so long. See it the top left. And of this one row. It's gonna take me a whole week to finish this one row. Hmm. There go another butterfly. Rest <laughs> Coleman. Yes, ma'am. You know, if I had wings like that butterfly. I'd fly far away from this field and I'd never come back. I'd fly away to places that I read about in my books. Places like Africa and China and Australia. And I'd fly way up in the clouds and everybody would say, there you go that little flying girl. And I would wave to everyone down below. Hello everyone, hello, hello. Pastor Coleman, stop daydreaming and get back to work girl. Yes ma'am, pick, pick, pick. All day long, pick, pick, pick. Well, it's another day. You have finished picking cotton. Me and Mama put our cotton on the scale to see how much money we made for the day. Mr. Johnson say that's, oh, that's 83 pounds. I went around and looked and said, oh no, Mr. Johnson, that's 183 pounds. Mr. Johnson said, oops, I forgot, Bessie, you can read. I said, yes, sir, I can read. And I can cipher real good too. So Mr. Johnson started mumbling and grumbling. I gotta watch out for that little girl. That little girl can read and write real good and she can count real good too. That little girl can be trouble. And he just mumbled and grumbled. Mama, on the other hand, Mama was so proud, Mama said, that little girl gonna make herself something special one day. I just know it. And she got spunk too. She just stood up to Mr. Johnson just like that. So it's another day of picking cotton in the field for me and mom. My name is Elizabeth Bessie Coleman and I'm nine years old. I was born January 26, 1892 in Atlanta, Texas. Mama said, when I was about three, four years old, we moved to another part of Texas called Waxahachie, Texas. So I lived with my mama and my daddy and my three little sisters. My daddy's name is George. My mama name is Susan. My three little sisters, Georgia, Eloise, and Nigel. I got two older brothers, too, Walter and John. They went to live in the big city of Chicago to look for work. And I think they joined the army, I'm not sure. We're barely surviving. Most days we don't have enough food. Sometimes I would ask mama for seconds and mama said, there ain't no more seconds, Bess. My mom and daddy sharecroppers. I don't know what a sharecropper is. So when I don't understand something, I put it in the back of my head to think about later on. They said my daddy half Indian. I don't understand that neither. So there's no job. So my daddy said he being half Indian, he gonna go to Oklahoma, Indian territory and look for work. And when he find work, he's gonna build a big house. We have lots of room and have lots of food and he's gonna send for everybody. But we waited and waited for my daddy to send for us. And my daddy never did send for us. So now it's just me and mom and my three little sisters. 
I'm the oldest one, so I got to look after everybody. I'm the only one that can read and write. Mama can't read nor write. And most of the people in the other shanty shacks, they can't read or write neither. They bring the letters for me to read and write. And sometimes they bring the newspaper for me to read. So I pretty much have to look over everybody. But I don't mind. So <coughs> when the sun is out, me and Mama pick cotton in the cotton field. And when it's raining out, I help Mama pick houses um... up on the hill. I don't like helping mama being a maid in the big house on the hill. And I don't like picking cotton neither. But the one thing I do like, I like going to school. I like to read about people and places and mountains and rivers and streams and crocodiles and flowers and rocks. I just like to find out about everything. I like to learn things. Uh, oh. come, come back and see it's ready. But better than... Reading, math is my favorite subject. Oh, I like to draw circles and triangles and squares and find out how much space is inside each one of them. I like going to school and I like to learn things. But I can't go to school until we finish picking the cotton. That's not till the end of November, 1st of December. And school starts in September, so I'm going to miss a lot of school. I can't go to school till we finish picking the cotton. So sometimes mama let me stay home to watch my sisters. And when mama come home, I would say, mama, put your feet up. Or to cook supper, put my little sisters in their sleeping clothes. And we would eat supper. And mama would help me wash the dishes and put it away. Then we would all climb in mama's bed. And I would read the Bible to mama. Then we would all fall asleep in mama's bed. <sighs> and we wake up the next morning. Back in the cotton field, all working in the house as a maid. But this one time, Mama come home. Mama said, Bess, I don't know what I'd do without you, girl. You look after your little sisters. You take care of the family business. You look after other people. The circus is coming to town. I'm going to give each one of you a shiny new nickel to go to the circus. Oh, Mama, thank you, Mama. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mama. Thank you. The day of the circus, I took my little sisters by the hand. Oh, when we almost got to the circus, we could hear the circus music. Oh, we could smell the hot dogs and the popcorn. Oh, we were so excited to be going to the circus. When we got to the circus, there were two lines. One line all the way around the circus that says, for colors only. Then there was another line, not too far, that says, for whites only. So now if I get in this line, the circus will be over before I get my ticket. And I don't want to miss a thing. I'm going to get in this line. Four tickets, please. Says, did you see the sign? Yes, sir. Can you read? I said, oh, yes, sir, I can read. He says, for what's only? But then why are you in this line? I just want four tickets, please. Because if I get in that line, the circus will be over by the time I get my ticket. No, nope, can't get your ticket in this line. Just four tickets, please. Nope, in that line. We might as well go on back home. Next year, we'll get up real early, and we'll be the first one in line. Come on, let's go back home. Then one of my little sisters started to cry. Then pretty soon, all three of them were crying. I says, no, don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. I'll tell you what. I'll fly over the circus, and I'll tell you exactly what's in the circus tent, okay? Here I go. I'm flying. 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 I'm way up in the air. Whoa. Look at all the people in the circus tent. Whoa. And I see elephants. Big elephants and they're marching behind one another. And they're sitting on little tiny stools. <laughs> and then they're, they're white horses with flowers on their head. And there's a lady standing on the horse. Bess, what else? What else do you see, Beth? What else? Oh. I see a big ring of fire. 
there's a tiger jumping through the ring of fire. <laughs> yes, what else? What else? What else? But then I see clowns. Clowns with big red noses and big shoes and they're hitting one another. <laughs> oh, that was fun, wasn't it? Although it was a pretend circus, it was fun. Okay. Well, you're laughing now. That's good. So come on, let's go home. Next year, we'll get up real early. We'll be the first one in lines, okay? Okay. Then we went home and I told mom all about it. Mom said, Bess, that's just the way things is right now. Maybe in the future, we'll all be able to go through the same line. That's something else I didn't understand. So I put that in the back of my head to think about later on. So as time went on, we finished picking the cotton. The first of December. That means I can go to school. <laughs> my school was three miles away. But I would walk so fast and then it seems like I would just glide the other half of the way. I got there in no time. Says so good morning. Oh, well, my teacher says, good morning, Miss Coleman. We're so glad to see you. Uh, we remembered you from last year. We know you're a smart little girl and you can catch up with your classmates in no time. She said, and make sure you tell your mommy hello and be glad to see you. And she gave me a folder with all of my work in, a big folder. And she said, now take your time. And let's see, this is the first of December. Uh, Christmas is coming up pretty soon. So sometimes in the new year, you should catch up with all the other kids and have all of your homework done. I says, thank you. I couldn't wait to get home. Put my sisters to bed. I turned up the kerosene lamp and I read chapters one, chapters two, chapters three. I started writing my sentences, my paragraphs. Put that down. I started doing my math and I fell asleep. Mama said, Bess, Bess, it's 11 o'clock, girl. You can't do it all in one night. I said, Mama, give me five more minutes. Just let me finish this. I finished that. The next day I went to school. I gave my teacher the folder. She looked through the folder. She says, you did this all last night? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> she said, well, I'm going to have to check them more carefully to make sure they're correct. But just looking through it, it looks correct. And you did this all last night? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> she said, Bessie. Bessie, you are gifted, little girl. You're gifted. You are so smart, Bessie Coleman. You've caught up with all the kids in one night. And they've been here since September. You are truly gifted, little girl. And then she called the other teachers. Come look. Come look at Bessie's work. Look at what she did last night. The teacher says, oh, she's truly gifted. We have to tell your mama to save up money to send you off to finishing school. Thank you, ma'am. I feel, felt proud inside. Then I went outside for recess. I talked with all the other kids who've been there since September. And the word got out that I did all my homework. They said, Bessie, who helped you with your homework? I said, no one helped me with my homework. Mama can't read nor write. My little sister's too little. I said, well, who helped you? I said, nobody helped me. I said, you sure is smart, Bessie Coleman. I said, well, when I read, the answer just come in my head. And when I do my math, the answer just come and I write it down on paper. I don't know where it comes from. It comes in my brain somehow. I said, wow, you sure is smart, Bessie Coleman. Then we played games and just talked about everything that I missed since September. And then when it was time to go home, I said, let's see who can get home the fastest. You take this road and I'll take this road. On your mark, get set, go. I would run so fast, it seemed like I would just glide home. And I would be the first one there. And I would wait. What's taking them so long? After about 15, 20 minutes, they come huffing and puffing. Ah. Ah. I said, it sure took y'all a whole 
a long time. This said, of a Bessie. It's three miles, you know. I said, I got here in no time. I got little wings right out of here. I just flew here. I said, you're always talking about flying, Bessie Coleman. You can't fly. I said, I got little wings right under here. I said, let me see wings. Nope. Let me see wings. Nope. It only comes out when I'm by myself. I said, you don't have no wings. Do too. Be true here, did not. And we did that every morning and every evening. And I was the fastest one. I would always be the first one there. So, we finished. After everything's done, we've been finished picking the cotton. I was going to school. I was reading and writing, getting all my work done, being the fastest one to school. Then I got up in the eighth grade. My school only went up to the eighth grade. Back then, you had three choices. You can either pick cotton in the cotton field, go work in the sawmills, or if you were smart enough and your mom and dad had money, they can send you off to finishing school, which was like college back then, 12th grade college. Somehow mama got enough money from the churches, some kind of scholarship money. And they sent me off to the all colored agricultural school in Langston, Oklahoma, which is today Langston College. I said, mama, I ain't never been away from home before. Mama said, don't worry, you'll be just fine. And I know you're gonna be the smartest girl in that class. So. I went off to the all-colored agricultural school in Langston, Oklahoma. I sat down front and I would take my notes, raise my hand when I asked a question, raise my hand when I wanted to answer a question. I was learning. Oh, boy, I like learning. I like being in school. I took world literature, took American literature and American history. I took philosophy, religion, geometry, algebra, Oh, I took my notes, my hand would go up. Wrote my notes, my hand would go up. I made all A's in my classes. I would say, dear mom, I'm making all A's in my classes. I'm making new friends and enjoying the sights. Let everybody read this letter. Love, Bess. Oh, I just like learning and being in school. But after one semester, mama didn't have no more money. She run out of money. I had to come back home, picking cotton. I don't like this cotton field. I want to make something of myself. I want to do something important. I don't know what, but something important. And I can't do nothing in this cotton field. I'll write a letter to my brother, Walter, in Chicago. Dear Walter, can I please come and live with you in Chicago to look for work? Because there's nothing here but this hot cotton field. Love, Bess. So I sent the letter off. In about two weeks time, the letter came back. Dear Bess, you can come and live with me in Chicago. There are plenty of work here in Chicago. <gasps> but I didn't tell mama. How am I gonna tell mama this? So I started following her all day long. I would follow behind her. She said, Bess, what's the matter? <coughs> and one time I followed behind her so closely, I bumped into her. She said, Elizabeth Bessie Cole, what's the matter? I said, Mama, um, um, I wrote a letter to Walt and asked Walt if I could come and live with him in Chicago, and Walter said it was okay. Mama said, Oh, Bess, come here, Bess, come here. Oh, Bess, oh, you're so beautiful. You're, you're so strong. You're smart. You don't belong in this cotton field. I can't hold you in this cotton field, Bess. You don't belong here. There's something out there for you. So you have my blessing. You can go to Chicago to live with Walter. She had clothes. We didn't hardly have enough clothes. So she gave me some of her clothes. Mama said, now, Bess, when you get to Chicago, you mind Walter, you hear? You listen to everything Walter say. 
I said, yes, ma'am. I'll mind Walter. She said, now, Bess, I heard about the people in the city. They're real tricky. So you don't talk to strangers, Bess. You hear me? You listen to Walter and you stay with Walter all the time. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, Bess, please don't go to that big city and be miserable, Bess. If you don't like Chicago, come back home, Bess. I said, Mama, I'm going to make myself like Chicago because I don't want to come back in this cotton field. Oh, I was the first one from the Shanty Shack to go to the big city of Chicago or to go to any big city. Everybody came to the train station to see me off. I said, when I get to Chicago, I'm going to send back newspaper clippings and I'm going to send back pictures of the buildings and the people. And I want everybody to read them. I'm going to send back newspapers, everybody to read. In the distance, I can see the smoke from the train. You can feel the rumble on the ground. Oh, I was so excited to be going to the big city of Chicago. Oh. When the train pulled up, I waved to everyone until the train was way out of sight. Bye. 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 <laughs> I was headed on the Rock Island line. Headed for Chicago. Oh, from Texas to Chicago, it took us 24 hours. Oh. Hi, my name is Bessie Cole. I'm on the way to Chicago to look for work. I'm going to live with my brother. You going to Chicago too? Oh, good luck to you. Hi, my name is Bessie Cole. I'm going to Chicago to look for work. You're going to Ohio? Well, good luck to you. Oh, I didn't sleep a wink. I stayed awake. When the train stopped, I would look out the window. Oh, oh, look at that building. Whoa. That night, people were sleeping. Oh, not me. I stayed awake all night on the Rock Island line. Mama packed me lunch. Mama packed me three pieces of sweet bread, two pieces of fried chicken, some grapes from the backyard, and two glasses of water. So I would eat my lunch, rocking on the Rock Island line, look out the window when the train stopped. <laughs> oh. Way that next day, way into the night, he said, Chicago, Chicago next stop. Oh, that's me, that's me. Ooh, I'm going to like Chicago just fine. Oh, the people were knock me over. There were so many people. <laughs> wow, look at the tall buildings. Wow. That looks like my brother, Walter. Walter, Walter, I'm over here. I'm over here, Walter. I'm over here. Walter came over, introduced me to his wife and friend. And we walked all the way back to Walter's house. It wasn't far. And Walter pointed out big houses as we went. And we got to Walter's house. Walter said, Bess, maybe you can find work as a maid in one of these big houses. He says, oh, no, no, Walter, no. I didn't come to Chicago to be no maid, Walter. I didn't want to be a maid in Texas. So I definitely don't want to be a maid here in Chicago. So I set out to look for work. On the way back to Walter's house, I saw a sign in the barber shop that says, Manicurist Wanted. I said, Walter, what's a manicurist? He said, that's a person who nails and things. So I looked in the window to see what the ladies were doing. I saw exactly what they were doing. I went inside, I says, I'm here for the manicure's job, sir. He said, do you have any experience? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, tell me a little bit about it. So when I was describing it to him, I kept looking at the corner of my eyes to make sure I got it right. I looked at the ladies. I said, well, first you would cut the nails and then you would brush the nails. And then after you finished brushing the nails, you would put the, the hand in a pan of water and wash the hand and then dry it off. And then, of course, you would apply 
lotion. And then once you finish lotion in the hand, you would polish the nails and put it under the fan to dry. He said, ah, sound like you've got a lot of experience. You have the job as a manicurist. You can start first thing in the morning and it pays $2 a week. Now inside, I was going $2 oh, That's a lot of money, $2. I said, yes, sir. I'll be here first thing in the morning. And I went back to Walter's house and said, Walter, I've got a job as a manicurist. Dear mama, I've got a job as a manicurist in the big city of Chicago, making two whole dollars a week. I'm going to send you one dollar every week, and I want you to save it up so you can bring your sisters and yourself to Chicago, and we can live as one big happy family. Let everybody know that I have a job in the big city of Chicago. Oh, and I worked at that barbershop as a manicurist. And the first couple of weeks, I still looked at the ladies to make sure I got it right. But then after that, I got my own clients. Ladies would come in there and say, oh, we want best to do our nails. And those ladies became my best friends of all time. But something was eating away inside of me. I said, there's got to be more than being a manicurist. So I kept on doing nails and listening to people's stories as I did their nails. But this particular day, soldiers came in there. The soldiers just got back from Paris, France. And they said, you know, the usual thing. I said, what did y'all see? They said, well, there were women flying planes in Paris, France. I says, what did you just say? He said, there were women flying planes in Paris, France. They brought us supplies and they brought us the mail. There were women flying planes in Paris, France? I said, yes. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. I want to fly for real. As a child, I pretended to fly, but this time I want to fly for real. Everybody in the barbershop laughed at me. I said, no, I want to fly. I said, Bessie Cole, what do you know about flying? I said, I don't know anything about flying, but I'm smart. I can learn anything. I said, well, who's going to teach you, Bessie Coleman? I said, there are flight schools here in Chicago. Somebody will teach me. I said, well, good luck with you, Bessie Coleman. And then went on snickering and talking, but I was serious. And Mr. Robert Abbott, who owns the Chicago Defender newspaper, happened to be in the barbershop. He became my best friend and mentor while I was in Chicago. He says, you know what? Under all of my newspaper boxes and papers and things, there are flight school here in Chicago. I'll look for the addresses. He says, oh, Mr. Abbott, thank you. Thank you so much. The next day, Mr. Abbott came back. He came back with the addresses of three flight schools. Oh, I was so excited. He says, okay, Bess, you're on your way. I knocked on the first flight school door. Come in. Good morning, sir. My name is Bessie Coleman. I want to enroll in your flight school. I want to become a pilot. I want to learn how to fly. He says, what did you say? <clears throat> Good morning, sir. My name is Bessie Coleman. I want to become a pilot. I want to enroll in your flight school. And he was a portly gentleman. He was smoking a cigar. He said, I heard you the first time. I just wanted to make sure I heard you right. You fly. <laughs> There's no room in the sky for you. You belong on the floor, scrubbing it and keeping it clean. Be gone. Don't waste my time. It seemed like someone just ripped my heart out.
I went to the second school, same thing. I went to the third school, the same thing. No one would teach me how to fly because of the color of my skin and because I'm a woman. Oh, I remember Mama used to tell me, said, Bess, can't, don't live in the Coleman household. Don't let him tell you that you can't, Bess. Oh, what I was so disappointed. I, I really wanted to make something of myself. I, I just, I was going to pay them. It wasn't like I wasn't going to pay them. Oh, I had to get myself together before I went back to the barbershop. <sighs> when I got back to the barbershop, they said, Bess, tell us the good news. There's no good news. I said, all three turn you down? All three turn you down. I said, but at least we tried, though, didn't we, Mr. Abbott? We tried. I'm going to go back every week and I'll test them until they accept me. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll think about something else. I, I can't fly again. I'll think about something else I want to do. Mr. Abbott said, no, best no. Is this something you really want to do? I said, yes, sir. I really wanted to fly. He said, well, you know what? We might have to go all the way to Paris, France to learn how to fly. <laughs> Mr. Abbott, you think so? You think so? He said, now don't get too excited. First, we have to apply to the school and see if they'll accept you. So Mr. Abbott and I sat down and we wrote letters to seven flight schools in Paris, France, and we sent the letters off. Every day I would look in the mailbox. I would know, I know it was too early, but I, I just thought maybe the letters would come. After about three months, there was a letter. It came from France. Oh, I hope this is good news. Dear Miss Coleman, we received your letter requesting to become a student of aviation. However, we do need other paperwork that must be done in order to enroll in our School of Aviation. On behalf of the Caldron Brothers School of Aviation, we would be delighted to teach you how to fly. We look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> Mr. Abbott, read the letter, Mr. Abbott. I could, uh, I'm too excited, I, I could have misread. Read it, Mr. Abbott. Read it. Mr. Abbott said, oh, yeah, Bess. They want to teach you how to fly. Everybody in the barbershop, read it, read, read it, read it. <laughs> they want to teach me how to fly. They want to teach me how to fly. <laughs> they didn't even ask what color I was. They just want to teach me how to fly. <laughs> Mr. Abbott said, all right now, Bess. You can get excited now, but we got to come up with a plan. Um, all right, you're gonna need a passport. I said, no problem. I'll fill out the paperwork. I'll send off for my passport. He says, all right, you're gonna leave lots of money because you're gonna have to get on the train from Chicago to New York, get on the ship. And when you get over to Paris, France, you have to find a place to stay and you might can't find work. So you're gonna need lots of money. I said, okay, I got another job at the Chili Parlor. I got another job part-time working as a usher downtown at the theater. I put the word out to the churches to help me with my endeavor. And surely but slowly, envelopes came in once a week from the churches. So I worked at the chili parlor, I worked as a manicurist, and I worked part-time as an usher. He says, okay, Mr. Abbott says, all right. There's one more thing, Bess. When you get there, they might not speak English. You've got to learn to speak French. I says, no problem, Mr. Abbott. 
I enrolled in the Belize School of French, downtown Chicago. I studied and I studied. Oh, by now, of course, I had my own apartment. I had stick-ups all over the wall. And I would practice. Come here, tell you. Come here, tell you. Come here, tell you. Je m'appelle. Je m'appelle Coleman. Je m'appelle Coleman. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir, mademoiselle. Au revoir, bonjour. Oh, I had stickers all over my wall. Je ne comprenais pas. Je ne comprenais pas. Bonsoir. Bonsoir, mademoiselle. Bonsoir, bonjour. Bonjour. Bonjour, bonjour. Parlez-vous français? Parlez-vous français? Parlez-vous français? Merci et vous. Merci et vous, mademoiselle. Merci et vous. Oh, I practice and I practice. Qu'est-ce que c'est que cela? I practice and I practice until I got the language. I was fluent in French. Three years time came, I was ready. My passport came back. I had enough money saved up. I could speak the language. I said, when you see me again, I'll be aviatrix, Bessie Coleman. So I got prepared to get on the train. I got on the train from Chicago to New York. When I got to New York, that ship was so big, it was like it was touching the clouds. Oh, I've never seen anything that big. It was the SS Imperita. Oh, I remember it was the fall of 1920. I got on that ship and everybody was waving, so I waved too. I didn't know anybody. I just waved to everybody. Oh, it was a beautiful sail. It was absolutely beautiful. I would walk out on the deck and say, birds, in a few months, birds, I'm gonna be flying right next to you, birds, so watch out. Oh, when I got to Paris, France, I thought Chicago was something, but Paris, France was absolutely gorgeous. Oh, the beautiful cobblestone streets, the statues, Oh, the fountains, the beautiful flower gardens. Oh, the buildings were huge. And they had golden dome tips, stained glass windows. Oh, Paris was beautiful. They would ride by in their carriages and say, Bonjour, mademoiselle. And I would say, Bonjour, monsieur. <laughs> oh. I lived in a small town called La Croix Toy. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't too far from the Somme River. I found out that my flight school, the Coldron Brothers School of Aviation, was about seven miles away. So to save money, of course I walked. My school in Texas was three miles away and I got there in no time. So I prepared for flight school. I said, Bess, you're one step closer of becoming a pilot. Oh, and those seven miles, I walked so fast, it seemed like I would just glide there in no time. When I got there, they said, welcome, <laughs> Mademoiselle Coleman, welcome. Welcome to the Coldron Brothers School of Aviation. And I shook everybody else's hand. And he says, all right, everybody have a seat. This is a 10 month course. It's divided into three parts. There's a written part, there's a mechanical part, and you have to fly solo. Once you finish those three, you will get your pilot's license. There were 52 people in the class. They were all men. I was the only woman, the only black person in the class, but I didn't mind. I was there to learn how to fly. So he gave us our textbooks and told us to read chapter one. And he showed us around the hangar, the runway, the supply closet. And he says, all right, We'll see everyone tomorrow morning. Of course, I went home. I read chapters one, chapters two. I wrote down all of my vocabulary. I did all of my diagrams. The next day I sat down front. He would ask questions, my hand would go up. 
He says, easy, Mademoiselle Coleman, one page at a time. Make sure everybody knows one page at a time. But I was learning. Oh, oh I wrote my notes, my hand to go up. I was learning. We talked about aerodynamics, anything that had to do with flying. We talked about the Bernoulli principle of flying, what makes things fly. We talked about weather, temperature, wind speed, wind direction. We talked about lift and drag. Oh, I wrote my notes. I was learning. I was learning. We talked about pressure, air pressure. We talked about plane maneuvers. We talked about the figure eights and the bank turns and the loop in the loop. Oh, I wrote my notes. I was learning. I was learning. We talked about the parts of the plane, the propeller, the rudder, the rudder bar, the tail. We talked about the tactometer, the compass bearing. Oh, I was learning. I was learning. I wrote down my notes. My hand would go up. I learned. In two months' time, I was eligible for the written test. I took the test, A+. Plus. Two more months, I was eligible for the mechanical test. I put on my tool belt. I went out to the plane. I made sure there was enough air in the tire. I changed the oil in the plane. I took off the propeller in the front, greased the propeller, put the propeller back on, went in the back of the plane, made sure the tail and the rudder could turn, made sure there were no rocks or sticks in it. I went inside, I adjusted the tachometer, I adjusted the compass bearing, I was done. The teacher came out, he says, check, 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 check. Everything's good. Mechanical test, A plus. He said, in one week time, I'll take you up so that you'll learn how to fly. Yes, sir. Wow. Those two weeks came. I was so, so excited. I've never been in a plane before. My instructor got in the front. I got in the back. Oh, I was so excited. <laughs> he says, Mademoiselle, you watch everything that I do to make sure that you can learn what I'm doing. I said, yes, sir. He says, put on your safety latch. Put on my safety latch. He placed his feet on the rudder bar. That's what you use to steer the plane while it's taxing the runway. Right next to his front knee was something about as big as a baseball bat. It's called the flight stick. That maneuvered the plane left and right, pull back, ascending, going up, push down, descending, going down. One of our students got out and he turned the propeller like a rubber band until it got real tight and he let it go. Then the plane caught. Ta -da 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 the plane started to shake. Woo -hoo. I was so excited. Oh, and then he pushed forward on the flight stick and the, the plane eased off down the runway. When we got our signal to go up, he pulled back on the flight stick. I could hear the engine. <laughs> oh, the breeze was cool on my face. He pulled back and we climbed higher and higher. Woo! <laughs> wow, this is nice. He says, are you okay, mademoiselle? I says, yes, I'm fine, thanks. He says, I'm gonna go around twice to get enough speed so that we can do our first flight maneuver, the figure eight. He says, okay. Wow. I have to hold on to my, my seats for that. All of a sudden, all of a sudden my stomach didn't feel so good. Are you okay, mademoiselle? I says, no, I'm not okay. Oh, my stomach's on fire and I'm throwing up. 
<laughs> he says, don't worry, mademoiselle, you're in good company. All of my students do the same thing when they come up the first time. Just hold on, I'm gonna take her down now. He says, okay. <laughs> when we touch them, and we tax it in the, ham the hanger, he says, okay, mademoiselle, you're going home. Will I see you tomorrow? I says, I don't know, maybe. Oh, I was a mess. I threw up over everything. Oh, my stomach was on fire. My head hurt. I don't want to fly no more. Oh, I don't want to fly no more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. By the time I got home, that little voice says, Bess, you're going to let this stop you. I thought you want to make something of yourself. You're almost there, Bess. The written test, the mechanical test, now you just have to fly, Bess. You're going to let a little upset stomach stop you. I said, no, you're right. That little voice, I was talking to that little voice. I said, you're right. I'm not going to let this stop me. So I cleaned myself up real good. <clears throat> the next day I went back. He says, Mademoiselle Coleman, thank you so much for coming back. Most of the times when I take my students up the first time, I never see them again. Thank you so much for coming back. So he took me up the second time the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth time. Somebody. How do you feel? I says, I think I'm ready. He says, I think so too. He says, in one week's time, you'll go up. This time, you'll be the only one in the plane. You'll be in the front seat. Oh, I was a week away and I was nervous already. My knees were shaking. Oh. When I saw how some of the other men looked when they took their tests, I wanted to look like a pile of two. So I went into town to the flight store to got, I wanted to get some flight flying clothes. So when I got to the store, the lady said, oh, you've come to the right place, all right. Everyone comes here when they want to get some flying clothes. She said, try this coat on. This looks like your size. I said, oh yeah, looks good. She said, oh, don't forget your hat. And the hat, of course, she said, the hat buttons underneath. She says, okay, I like it. And of course, you're gonna need your goggles. I said, yeah, I like it. And your scarf. She says, for the life of me, I meant to ask the other pilots, why do pilots need the scarf? I said, well, a lot of times when our goggles get fogged up, we have to get something right away to get the fog off our goggles so we can see. And sometimes the engine kick back oil and we have to get the oil off our goggles. We can't look around for a piece of cloth. So we have to have something right there to wipe our gog goggles off. And of course, some people use it as a fashion statement. She says, well, well, well. Now I know what we have got the scarves for. She said, look in the mirror. I said, yeah, I like it. She says, oh, don't forget your boots. And I tried on all kinds of boots. I tried on boots that had buttons, Boots that had zippers, suede boots, boots that were stringed all the way up to the top. And I kind of like these. These had strings and laces all the way up to the very top. She said, now, when you get finished, you make sure that you walk so that you can see them and see how it feels. I said, yeah, I kind of like these. They're laced all the way up to the top. Yep, I like these. But she said, that's another thing. Why do pilots always wear boots? I said, well, we have 
flared pant legs. So if we put our flared pant legs into our boots, then of course the pant leg won't get caught up in any of the instruments. She says, well, well, today I'm learning a lot of things. She said, how do those feel? I said, oh, it feels great. She says, thank you so much. She says, good luck to you when you take your test. All the day when I walked in to that air school, my knees were buckling. I was so scared. All the men were giving me the thumbs up, said, Bess, you're the best pilot out of all of us. Just remember your diagrams in your head. Just do what you, you've been practicing on. They gave me the thumbs up, said, I can do this. This was the first time I was in the plane by myself. Oh, I was so scared. I said, okay, Bess, you can do this. All right, put on my goggles, put on my safety latch, placed my feet on the water bar. Fellow student got out and turned the propeller. The propeller started to shake. I taxied the one way. I pulled back on the flight stick. I could hear the engine. I climbed higher and higher. When I got way past the flight school, my scarf sailed in the breeze. If all of Chicago could see me now. I told you birds, I'm gonna be flying right next to you birds. In the sky, there's no prejudice in the sky. In the sky, you'll feel free. The breeze was on my face. My sky flying in the breeze. I did all of my maneuvers. I did my figure eights. Did my bank turns. I did it, Bess. I did it. I did all my maneuvers. So I slowly pushed down on the flight stick. I got lower and lower till I could see the flight school off in the distance. And I touched down. <laughs> I taxied the runway. I pulled into the hangar. Oh, I said, Bess, you did it. You did it, Bess. You did it. I said, okay, Bess. Don't cry. I don't want the men to see me cry, okay? Okay. Oh, everyone come running out to the, the plane. Everyone come running out to the plane. Oh, I got hugs. I got hugs. Hugs, hugs and handshakes. Thumbs up. The instructor said, all right, everyone inside, inside. Everyone sat down and said, Bessie Coleman, come down front. I said, Bessie Coleman, we've never had a student quite like you. This was a 10 months course and you did it in eight months. You did everything with class and precision. So you've earned your pilot's license. So I give to you Bessie Coleman from the Caudron Brothers Ecole d'Aviation de Ferret Caudron La Croix Toy France, your international pilot's license, June 15th, 1921. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I says, please forgive me. I'm a little emotional. Hey? I'm going to just go now. He said, we'll understand. We'll celebrate again tomorrow when you come in. He says, okay. All the way home, I said, yes, Bess. Yes, Bess, you did it. You did it, Bess. You did it. You made something of yourself, Bess. You have your pilot's license, your international pilot's license. You can fly here in Paris, France, and back home in the United States. Yes. Of course, I wrote a letter right away. Dear Mr. Abbott, dear Mama, everyone at the chili parlor in the barbershop, I got my pilot's license today. 
but I won't be home for another six months. I'm going to go into the Netherlands to learn advanced swine on the new Fokker planes they have there. But let everybody know, love best. And after six months of study in the Netherlands, I sailed back to the United States. But I kept my pilot's clothes on because I didn't want anybody to miss me. But the word had gotten around. Bessie Coleman, first black woman to get her pilot's license, was coming back. So when I started deboarding the ship, there were hundreds of people there that said, there she is, there she is, that's Bessie Coleman. Bessie Coleman, tell us, what was it like? Bessie Coleman, tell us. Oh, the question, the question. The newspaper men would say, Bessie, pose for the camera. Pose for the camera, and I would pose. Pose for the camera again, Bessie, pose. Oh, they would take my picture. My picture appeared in the front of all the newspapers. And they said, you got to come to my school. You got to come to my church to tell us what was it like being the only woman in a foreign country? Oh, the question, questions. I said, I can't stay in New York for too long. I've got to go back in my hometown of Chicago. But I did go to a couple of the schools and I would talk to the boys and girls and say, boys and girls, you too can learn to fly just like me. Not too long ago, I was a little girl in the cotton field in Texas. But look at me now. I'm an international pilot. Why walk when you can fly, boys and girls? Never let anyone tell you that you can't because you can. So my job now is to collect enough money to build my own flight school, and then I will teach you how to fly myself. You wouldn't have to go all the way to Paris, France and learn how to fly. So I stayed in New York for two days and I went back to Chicago. And when I got to Chicago, there were thousands of people there that had a big parade and I got hugs and kisses and I signed autograph and oh, they wanted me to come to their school. And I did that for about six months. And that's how I made money. But people said, now Bess, we want to see you fly. I didn't have my own plane. So I rented a JN Jenny biplane from the army, a JN Jenny surplus. Um, biplane because it has two wings and only two seats, one in the front, one in the back. So this is the kind of plane that I flew, a JN Jenny surplus. My first exhibition flying was at the Curtis Field in New York, Long Island. Thousands of people came. I dazzled the crowd. My scarf just flew in the breeze. I climbed up and I dived all the way down to the crowd and then I pulled back up again. And they would say, Hail Queen Bess, Queen of the Sky. Oh, and I did that for year after year. I dazzled the crowd flying. Fly away, fly away, fly up high. Fly away, fly away. What are you calling? I never come down. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.